भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम शैव नरोतम दिव्यम सरस्वती व्यास तथो जयाउदीर नष्ट प्रयेशु भद्रेशु नित्यम भागवत सेवया भागवत मुत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भक्तिर्नैष्टिके ओम अज्ञान तिमंद ज्ञानंजनाशलाकया चक्षुरुन्मल तस्म श्रीगुरव नम Hare Krishna. Last week we had uh, completed our discussion on the sixth chapter of the first canto of the Bhagavatam. So, a uh, quick recap of the chapter, and then we will continue with our discussion on the seventh chapter. So the sixth chapter was conversation between Narada and uh, uh, Vyasadev, and uh, this was really the ongoing conversation between Narada and Vyasadev. So um, quick recap of the chapter that uh, it started with the uh, uh, inquiries from Shila Vyasadev to Narada Muni about how he passed his life. after the departure of the sages so prior to that narad muni was describing his own uh, previous life to shila vyasadev and he had ended the fifth chapter uh, with uh, uh, the bhakti vedantas uh, giving him confidential instructions on uh, the science of krishna consciousness and then departing so the sixth chapter opened with uh, shila vyasadev asking of narad muni that how did he spend his life after the departure of the sages so following this uh, narad muni he begins to uh, recap that after the sages uh, departed the next significant thing that happened was uh, the demise of his mother and that she was bitten by a by a snake while going in the morning to milk the cow and uh, narad looking upon this as the mercy of the lord he left home and he began to travel everywhere living his life as a mendicant um in addition to that he also began to put in practice what he had learned from the bhakti vedantas specifically the uh, uh, the meditation on on lord so uh, once while narad was uh, seated under a banyan tree after having refreshed himself with some uh, water uh, as he was meditating on the lord uh, krishna appeared within his heart and very soon disappeared so narad muni extremely agitated by the disappearance of krishna tries to bring him back in his in his vision and the lord then informs him that he will not be able to see him again but he also gives him the the way out that how could he become qualified to see him and in doing so krishna glorifies the process of bhakti so following the instructions of krishna following the instructions of the bhakti vedantas narad muni spends the remaining life chanting and through this process of chanting he achieves perfection so uh, so when he reaches the natural end of his life then he gives up his present body and he gets a spiritual body uh, simultaneously and uh, narad muni concludes saying that in this in this spiritual body he travels everywhere and his only occupation now is glorifying the lord on the veena that he received from 
the Lord himself. And uh, Anad Muni also reiterates that now Krishna appears in his heart whenever he uh, wants. So uh, in this way, Narad concludes the chapter and then departs vibrating the, the, the Pina. So this is the this is this is where we end. This is the end of the sixth chapter, which is the conversation between Nara and Vyas. So we'll begin with the first verse of the seventh chapter. So the seventh chapter is titled The Son of Drona Punished. Shanaku Acha Nirgate Nara de Suta Bhagwan Badrayanaha Shutavam Stad Abhi Pretam Tatakim Makrod Vibuhu Translation Rishi Sonak said, O Suta, the great and transcendently powerful Vyasadev heard everything from. Sri Narad Muni. So after Narad's departure, what did Vyasadev do? So in a sense, this is the summary of the of the uh, or this is the uh, uh, this is the transition into the seventh chapter. So the sixth chapter ended with Narad telling Vyas about his past and present life and departing. And the seventh chapter begins with Sutta continuing his inquiry as to what did we ask to now? So the seventh chapter is, uh, is uh, um, the seventh chapter in a way is important uh, all chapters are important, but some chapter especially gets attention because it contains the four uh, uh, key verses from which the Bhagavatam expands. And we'll discuss them when we, when we come to them. So more about the first verse that we are uh, reading. So the first four verses of the seventh chapter are uh, basically uh, a summary of the uh, inquiry between Shonaka Rishi and Sutta Goswami. And the message that has been given over here is that uh, uh, that perfect vision of the, of the Lord can only be realized by devotional services. So, uh, so once again, the verse, uh, Rishi Sonak said, O Sutta, the great and transcendently powerful Vyasadeva heard everything from Sri Narad Muni. So after Narada's departure, what did Vyas do? So the conversation had begun with Vyas feeling incomplete in his service and Narada speaking to address his discontent. And in the course of the conversation, Narada had summarized and elaborated on why Vyas was feeling incomplete. Because he had not sufficiently and directly glorified Krishna and that in his writing, he had inadvertently leaded, led people uh, on the path of materialistic uh, enjoyment. So the sages had heard all this with rapt attention and now they're curious as to what did Vyas do after Shutvan, after he heard Tad Abhipretam. So Tad Abhipretam means uh, everything is mind desired. So the conversation between Narad and Vyas was uh, Narad in the mood of a spiritual master had asked Vyas to ask anything that he wanted and he had addressed all his inquiries. So at this point, he was Tad Abhipretam, that he had heard everything his mind, mind decided. So 
Kimakarattata. So what did he do thereafter? So we see in this verse, Sutta Goswami, he is addressing Vyas as Vibho Bhagavan Padrayana, which translates to the great transcendently powerful sage who resides in the spiritual ashram. So if you remember in concluding the previous chapter, Sutta Goswami had addressed Narad Muni as Bhagwan, and he had addressed Vyas as Vasavi Sutta. So we had a brief discussion that Vasavi Sutta was uh, 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 the son of the daughter of, of Vasu. So Satyavati was the daughter of, of, uh, of the Vasu and uh, Vyasadeva was born in not the most uh, conducive environment. So he was born without, between, between Parashamuri and Satyavati, they were not married to one another. Satyavati was, was, was a young maiden um, at the time. Satyavati was brought up by, uh, by, the, uh, by the chieftain of the fisherman clan, which was considered to be uh, Dasya. So his mother uh, was, was uh, Bhishma would call her a Dasi, a daughter of a Das. And uh, she was born from a cursed Apsara. So not the best uh, circumstances for Vyas. But in this verse, we see that Sutta Goswami is, is immediately asserting that despite all these apparent blemishes, Vyasadeva is Bhagwan. And uh, he addresses him so, not only because he is the empowered incarnation of Krishna, but because he is respected by the activities that he is doing. Not so much because of his birth or uh, his lineage, but really because of where he is situated right now. And Vyas is situated in the position of sincerely inquiring the process for making spiritual advancements for himself and for the benefit of others. So that is why Sutta Goswami is very reverentially, reverentially addressing Vyas as Bhagavan. In the purport, Prabhupada gives a brief summary of the chapter. He says, in this chapter, the clue for describing Srimad Bhagavatam is picked up as Maharaj Parikshit is miraculously saved in the womb of his mother. This was caused by drowning, Ashwatthama. So one of Ashwatthama's uh, name was the son of the, the, the son of uh, Dron, Dronacharya, so it's called Drowni. Acharya Drona's son, who killed the five sons of Draupadi while they were asleep, for which he was punished by Arjun. Before commencing the great epic Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Vyasadeva realized the whole truth by transcend devotion. So Prabhupada is giving us a brief glimpse into the chapter. Okay, we'll do the next verse. Any questions, comments? One seven two Sutta Vacha Brahmanadyam Sarasatyam Ashrama Paschamate Samya Prashiti Prokta Rishinam Satra Vardanaha. Sri Sutta said, On the western bank of the river Saraswati, which is intimately related with the Vedas, there is a cottage for meditation at Samya Prash which enlivens the transcendental activities of the sages. So Vyasa in this verse is referred to as Badrayana. So Badrayana is one who, so Ayan means resides, like uh, uh, Narayan. Narayan is a word for Lord Vishnu. So one who resides in Nar. 
So, so in form of Shuddha Shai Vishnu, he resides in all of us. So, so one of his name is Narayan. So Badrayan is one who resides in, 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 in Badri. So if you refer, we had a, we had a, a, a discussion on this in uh, one four fifteen. So if you refer to the lecture over there, you hear more about uh, Badrayana. So uh, so Sutta says that that Brahmanadyam Saraswatyam. So <clears throat> Brahm, so Nadyam we know is the is the means river. Previously, we had encountered this word Ritanabhyam, Lake River, where Narada actually sat to quench his th thirst. So, Brahmanadhyam is uh, translated in the word to word by Prabhupada as on the banks of the river, intimately related with the Vedas, Brahmanas, saints, and the Lord. So, it's interesting that Prabhupada translates. The, the word to word translation is kind of interesting. And the reason Prabhupada translates it is, uh, is uh, because of uh, the several meanings of the word Brahma. So, literally, uh, Brahma means one that grows or one which causes something to grow. So, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur mentions that in the Amar Kosh, the word Brahma can mean the Vedas, because the Vedas cause your knowledge to grow. It could mean truth, because truth causes your piety to grow. It could mean austerity, because austerity again causes your uh, pious uh, reactions to grow. It could mean Brahman, because the Brahman is infinite. It could mean Lord Brahma, because Brahma he appears in the material universe. He's the, he's the secondary creator. So he causes the universe to grow. <clears throat> it could mean uh, Brahman because uh, <clears throat> Brahman, again, causes your piety to grow. Or it could mean Prajapati because the Prajapati causes the population to grow. So in this particular context, Brahmanadyam is translated as a, as a place where there is a river of Vedas, a collection of the Brahmanas, and austerities to the Lord being performed. <clears throat> so, on the banks of such a river. So, there's a little bit of uh, wordplay that, uh, literally speaking, the ashram of Srila Vyasadev is on the banks of the river Saraswati. So, uh, so literally speaking, it is on it 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 is on the it is Brahmanadyam Saraswati on the banks of the river Saraswati. But uh, uh, looking deeper into the meaning, we also understand that the residence of Srila uh, Vyasadev was a place where uh, the Vedas were constantly being discussed, where the absolute truth was worshipped, where austerity was being uh, performed, and where the Brahmanas were congregating. So Vishnu Chakravati Thakur gives this deeper meaning. And uh, this, that, that was his ashram. So, uh, so the word ashram is, the root word of the ashram is, Shram. And Shram, as we know, means work. Shram eva hi kevalam. It's, it's only work. So in Sanskrit, when a word is prefaced by a, it is negated. So like aja. Ja means born, aja is unborn. Or anadi. Adi means end, anadi means one that never ends. Or like we say, agyan. Gyan means one who knows. Agyan means in ignorance. Now, when the, this A gets prefaced by another A, so which is a double negation, then the focus becomes that of emphasis. Like, uh, uh, so stith means 
one who is situated at a place. Asthit means that one who is moving around. Asthita means that one who is firmly fixed at, at, a, at, a, at a place. The charyam, charyam means conduct, one who carries oneself. Acharyam means one who does not carry oneself. And acharyam is that one who only carries one's, one, oneself according to what he says. So similarly, the ashram, the, there is a long way in front of shram. So ashram is a place where, where work is being performed with a lot of emphasis and focus. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada, he gives us two meanings of the, uh, of this, of the ashram. One is in the context of Varnashram. So Varnashram means that you're performing work according to your position in life, according to your Varna. And the second, he talk, talks about ashram as a spiritual retreat. So this is a place that is exclusively meant for making uh, spiritual advancements. On a side note also, sometimes, and uh, even though it is not supported over here, but you will hear this in a more, uh, I guess, in more uh, general discussion, sometimes people say ashram as a short A, so which is a place where you do not work. So it's a place where you, uh, where you, retire from your shram and then you go there to make spiritual advancements. So it's, it's a short ashram, ashram. But it is more colloquial as opposed to being supported by, by what the Sanskrit uh, meaning is. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada says, Srila Vyasadeva was a householder, yet his residential place is called ashram. And ashram is a place where spiritual culture is always foremost. It does not matter whether the place belongs to a householder or a mendicant. So this is the first meaning of ashram, that this is a place where spiritual advancement is made. Then Prabhupada gives the second meaning. The whole Varnashram system is so designed that each and every status of life is called an ashram. This means the spiritual culture is the common factor for all. The brahmacharis, grahasthas, vanaprasthas, and sannyasis all belong to the same mission of life, namely realization of the supreme. Therefore, none of them are less important as far as spiritual culture is concerned. The difference is a matter of formality on the strength of renunciation. The sannyasis are held in high estimation on the strength of practical renunciation. So Prabhupada is making the point that all ashrams should be considered to be equally suitable for making spiritual advancement. So one should not think that I am a grahastha. So um, the ashram is meant for enjoyment and not for spiritual advancement. So he says that the only reason that the sannyasis are respected is because of their renunciation. Because they are more exclusively focused on their spiritual advancement. But every ashram, whether it is uh, an ashram as a place of retreat, or whether it is a stage of life, one should utilize to make spiritual advancements. And the final point in this verse is that it's said on the western bank of the river, Saraswati. So, uh, so, so there is no historical record of a river called Saraswati outside the Vedas. Um, from a geographical uh, perspective or from a historical perspective. And, uh, there are, of course, uh, many theories about it. So based on the Vedas, some uh, Acharyas, they have plotted the course of Saraswati as coming down from the Himalayas. And uh, so we know that the place of Prayag is called Triveni because three rivers merge over there, uh, Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati. But actually there is only Ganga and Yamuna. There is no Saraswati. So they speculate that there was a river called Saraswati flowing at some point of time, but because of changes in, in, the, in, the, in the geographical environment, that river has now disappeared or it has become 
uh, subterranean. So apparently there are rivers that flow under, under Earth. Uh, even that theory now is kind of, because I think they have now ability to see under the Earth also. Uh, so, so mostly they think that there was a river that was flowing in some time, in the Vedic times, but is now, uh, but is now disappeared. Okay, so we'll do 173. Any questions on this? Okay, so we'll do 173. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, can you hear me? Yes, Mataji. So, uh, Vajrayana uh, is the same as the one who lives, who is in Badrikashram, like Madhvacharya um, got, received all the Gita and Bhagavatam from Badrikashram. He also refers Badr, Badri Narayana or Badr, he refers the Lord as Badri Narayana or Badrayana, I think. So, is he the same Lord, like Badrayana, the one who is in Badrikashram? So there's a difference between the two. Uh, Badrayana refers to uh, Shila Vyasadev uh, because he's a resident of uh, of uh, Badrika Ashram. Um, Badrinath is uh, Narnarayan Rishi. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. They are the presiding deity of that ashram. So they are Badrinath is the lord of is the lord of that uh, that place. Right, yeah, he, he performs austerity to relieve the um, Kaliuga people. Um, so Badrayana, like Ma, when Madhvacharya says Badrayana, he is calling Vasudeva basically. He's uh, exactly, exactly, okay. because uh, it said that Madhvacharya received initiation and knowledge from Srila Vyasudeva. Yeah, yeah. So that's why. Yeah, thank you. Great, Prabhuji. I was always thinking about this. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Okay, one seven three. Tasmen swashram evya so badri shanda mandite ashinopa upasprasya pranidadyo mana swayam. In that place, Srila Vyasadev, in his own ashram, which was surrounded by berry trees, sat down to meditate after touching water for purification. So, verse gives some more description of the ashram of Srila Vyasadeva. So, it is described as, as Mandite Badri. Mandite means surrounded by. And Badri is uh, berry trees, also, they're also known as Jujube trees. So Shanda means trees. So Badri Shande. So his ashram is on the banks of river, on the western bank of the river Saraswati, uh, surrounded by Mandite by, by berry trees. And because of this, the ashram is properly is properly known as Badrika Ashram. So this is an ashram where, where Badri trees are growing abundantly where berry trees are going abundantly. So it is one of the four uh, uh, tirthas. So people uh, who like to do the four tirthas, um, they are, uh, so Badri uh, is considered to be, so the four tirthas are uh, Badrika Ashram, Jagannath Puri, um, then Dwarka, and uh, Rameshwaram. So these are the four tirthas. Each of them represent a, for a particular yuga. So Badrika Ashram is for Satyug. Then uh, uh, Rameshwaram is for Treta Yuga. Then Dwapar Yuga is Dwarka. And for the age of Kali, it is uh, Jagannath. So people who do the Chardham Yatra, they visit these four dhams, and then there is also the Char Upadhams. So the Char Upadhams are Badrika Ashram, Kedarnath, Gangotri, and 
and uh, uh, EM Note 3. <clears throat> so it's it's been a it's been a place of pilgrimage since time immemorial. In um, in the in the Bhagavatam in the third canto, uh, in the conversation between Maitre and uh, Vidur, uh, Maitre Rishi says, "There in Badrika Ashram, the personality of Godhead." In his incarnation as the sage Nanarayan has been undergoing great penance since time immemorial for the welfare of all amiable living entities. <clears throat> so, uh, right from the beginning of Satyu, this has been a place of pilgrimage. Uh, Badrika Ashram is also mentioned in Mahabharat when the Pandavas uh, embark on their final journey. So after they renounce everything and they and they and they walk towards a Swargalok, then one of the places that they cross is is uh, Padrikashram. So Narad Muni is Sutta Goswami is beginning to describe what did Narada do? I'm mean, sorry, what did Vyas do after the departure of Narada? So he says that while sitting, Asina. In his own ashram, he first purified himself by apaha, upas, apaha upa sparshya. So apaha means water, and sparsh means touch. Upa sparsh means upa means close. So touch water that is that is uh, closely touch water or touch water that is close to you. So this is one form of shuddhi. So so we know. Like before we do DT worship, we do Achman. So there we sip, uh, we sip water. And uh, water is one of the, is one of the purifying uh, agents that purifies both the gross and the subtle body. So it is said that water from Tirthas or water that is a remnant of DTs or water that is consecrated by mantras or even just pure, cool, clean water without any foam or bubbles is considered to be purifying. So uh, when we are trying to prepare the, the Achman water for deity worship, especially in temples, then we consecrate the water with mantras. So we say Ganga, Chayamna, Chaygodavri, Saraswati, Narvada, Sindhu, Kaveri, Jalamusman, Sandim, Kuru. And then you know we do the beach, uh, uh, mantra on that. So uh, similarly, Srila Vyasadev, before beginning his meditation, he sits down and he purifies himself by, by touching consecrated water. So Narada had instructed Vyas that now what you should do is Think of the pastimes of the Lord in the trance for the liberation of people in general. So this was a specific instruction that Narad Muni had given to Srila Vyasadev in 1513. And Vyasadev is, we see now is complying with the instruction given to him by Narad Muni. So uh, what does he do over here? He says, it says, Pranidhyau Manaha. So Nad Muni had said that, think of the pastimes in trance. So Nad Muni is accordingly Pranitha Mano, that is now entering into trance. And trance really here means that uh, full concentration of the mind. Sometimes we think of trance as losing consciousness or uh, entering into a different state of uh, being, but here, that esoteric meaning is not really applied over here. Here it just trance means that he he uh, he entered into full concentration with his mind to think about the pastimes of the Lord. Okay, one seven four. Any questions, comments about this? Proji, um, you mentioned like uh, water for purification. He touched the water for purification. Is that like? So any water is purifying which has no bubbles and which is which is like or is it uh, only offered that is offered to the Lord and like chanted right. mantras on right so so what so what is said in uh, 
So this is from the DT worship manual, which is based on Haripati Vilas, that uh, um, um, if you have water from a Tirtha, use that, which is generally accepted as uh, uh, Ganga Jal, water from Ganges. Um, or if you have water that is eminent from DTs, um, use that. Or if you don't have that, use water that is consecrated by mantras. Or if you do not have that, use water that is uh, without foam and bubble and cool. So some, some kind of gradation is, is there. The best to use is water from a holy place. And if not that, then this, then this, uh, then this. Um, but it does say that uh, just uh, water without foams and bubbles is considered to be uh, purifying. And the reason foams and bubbles are, uh, uh, or does anybody know why are foams and bubbles considered to be uh, signs of impurity? I think there is a story that I heard like uh, the bubbles and then uh, the gum from the trees. Um, like there are four, um, four or five things that are impure to when. Yes, yes, very good. Yeah, so it's a long pastime and I won't repeat it, but, but, uh, uh, but when Indra was contaminated by the sin of killing a Brahman, yes. so then he transferred the sin to four things, to the sap of the trees, and um, to the sap of the tree, to women, um, to water, and uh, what was the fourth thing you were saying? Uh, I don't remember, Prudhi. I mean, I remember only the trees, women, and water. I don't remember the fourth one. Okay, or maybe it was, maybe it was, maybe it was uh, three. But yeah, that's the reason why water with with foam and bubbles is considered to be impure because it carries the, the the sin that indra accrued because of killing a brahman so we should not even drink the water that is or the bubbles i mean the we should not drink the bubbles from the water is that is that how it's a uh, I mean, it's 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 a uh, uh, it's so so i haven't read anywhere this statement but it seems to be a logical conclusion yeah that if bubble water and so really speaking uh, uh, if you read the past time it says foam so the foam that appears on the water is considered to be impure so um, if you have been to a beach then you will see that uh, there is there is a layer of like a whitey foamy substance that actually looks kind of dirty, um, but it seems to be extended to bubbles, uh, uh, bubbles uh, also. Um, but again, to be honest with you, I haven't heard anybody specifically say this that don't drink water with uh, bubbles. You know that would that would exclude the whole carbonated water industry. <laughs> um, Prabhuji, how how is um, water purifying this? How does it purify the subtle body exactly? So, uh, so water is considered to be uh, very absorbent. It it, it absorbs the uh, just just one minute. There's this big beeping sound that keeps coming. Uh, Either from your phone or from somewhere. I think somebody is not muted. Maybe. There's some beeping sound that keeps coming. So anyway, um, so water is considered to be very absorbent. It uh, uh, so it it is it is uh, um, it is more subtle than the gross elements, um, and the understanding is that. Uh, um, when we chant mantras or when we bathe the deities, then uh, the water absorbs the, uh, uh, the, the more subtle consciousness. 
so which is the reason why water is considered to be uh, considered to be a purifying so in any form of worship uh, water is given a lot of importance so if you see that in yagyas etc the first thing that gets established is water and um, uh, during the process of deity worship, during the process of any samskars, any kind of yagyas, water is very liberally used. So the first thing they do is they consecrate the water and then they, uh, then they use the water. Um, there's some, uh, there, there is apparently some scientific basis to it also. Uh, so, so there was some experiment done by some Japanese scientists who, who basically took pictures of the water under a under a electron microscope and he demonstrated that water on which mantra om was chanted it oh it's somebody somebody has a long big beeping sound coming <clears throat> so uh, um, so so leaving that aside uh, from the Vedic scripture, water is considered to be subtle in terms of absorbing spiritual consciousness. That's why the ashrams are always on the bank of a flowing river. And uh, the prominent form of Shuddhi is, uh, is, through, is, is, uh, is by taking a bath uh, in water. Hello. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, even in even in Christianity and even in Muslim in Islam, yeah, they use water for purification. They use water there. Yeah. 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 I was just reading also, that. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, Achuta. Uh, actually, it's Vilas Manjari. Um, I also wanted to comment, uh, even according to Shastra, air, water, and fire are considered purifying agents, right? Yes, that is yes. true. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, thank you. Uh, Prabhu, I think the noise is from, maybe it's from somebody, noise, uh, smoke detector. When the battery goes low, it makes this noise. Oh. So, do you also hear it or only I hear it? No, yeah, no, we, we hear it. it. Somebody is not muted. That's the only problem. Okay. I'm, I'm actually thinking maybe it's a smoke detector in my house. Uh, <laughs> I'm not hearing actually. Okay. Okay. So, this, this is, you know, this is how life is, right? You try and find fault with others and it comes out to be, to be within yourself. Uh, Prabhuji, I will be muting everyone. Uh, give me a second. I'll unmute only you. <laughs> okay. So now I'm the only one who's unmuted. So if the sound still comes, then I, we know where it's coming from. Okay, so 174. Bhakti yoga na manasi samyak prana hite male pashat purusham purnam mayam chata da pashrayam. Thus, he fixed his mind, perfectly engaging it by linking it in devotional service, bhakti yoga, without any tinge of materialism. And thus, he saw the absolute personality of Godhead along with his external energy, which was under full control. So these four verses, 1.7.4 to 1.7.7, are, uh, uh, they describe the trance of Srila Vyasadeva. I remember once uh, um, Guru Maharaj, he gave a whole seminar on these four verses, titled the trance of Vyasadeva. So they are considered to be uh, Amongst others, they are considered to be the pivotal verses of Bhagavatam. So Bhagavatam is said to be the expansion from different places. Like we had discussed, Bhagavatam is the expansion of the Mahavakya Om. Then the Bhagavatam is the expansion of the of uh, the mantra Om Namo Bhagavate Vasu Devaya. 
Then the Bhagavatam is expansion of the Vedanta Sutra 1.1.2, Janmadi Yasyata. Then the Bhagavatam is the expansion of the Brahma Gayatri, especially of the word Timai. Then it's an expansion of 1.1.1, the very first verse. It's the expansion of the Mangalacharan, the first three verses of the Bhagavatam. It's the expansion of the 10 topics of the Bhagavatam, 2.10.1. Then it's the expansion of the Chatur Shloki, which is 2.9.33 to 36. It is an expansion of the meditation of Srila Vyasadeva, which is what we are going to study, 1.7.4 to 7. Then it is an expansion of the first three chapters of the Bhagavatam. And it's considered to be the expansion of the first two cantos of the Bhagavatam. So in this verse, we see that two things are described. The first two lines of the verse, tell us what did Vyasadev do? And the last two lines of the verse tell us about what did he see? So what did he do? So Vyasadev is responding to Narad's instruction saying Samadina Anusvarta Tad Vichetisham that you now think of the past tense of the Lord in trance. So what is the process that he is using to meditate on the pastimes of the Lord? So he's following the process that was given in 1 to 12 earlier on, which, uh, so this is translation of 1 to 12, by rendering devotional service in terms of what he has heard from the Vedanta Shrutis, specifically following the process of Bhakti Yoga. So that is why Sudha Goswami, he uses the term Bhakti Yogena Manasi. So the verse begins with Bhakti Yogena, which is connecting with Krishna through the process of Bhakti. So Prabhupada in the purport, he says, perfect vision of the absolute truth is possible only by the linking process of devotional service. This is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. So does anybody know where in the Bhagavad Gita is this point made that one can link with the, or any one place, it's made at several places, so that one can link with the absolute truth only through the process of devotional service. So this is uh, one of the places it's there in the 12th chapter, verse six, verses six and seven, where Krishna says that uh, one who worships me giving up all their activities, and being devoted into me, then for them I am the swift deliverer of birth and death. So Prabhupada continues, one can perfectly realize the absolute truth, personality of Godhead, only by the process of devotional service. And one can enter into the kingdom of God by such perfect knowledge. Imperfect realization of the absolute by the partial approach of the impersonal Brahman or localized Brahm Paramatma does not permit anyone to enter into the kingdom of God. So this, this term Bhakti Yogena is very important because uh, uh, so Yogena means linking. So it, uh, it brings forth the potency of Bhakti very directly. That Bhakti is the process by which one is linked to Krishna. And uh, um, Krishna uses this, this term to glorify the process of pure devotional service. Does anybody remember a verse in Bhagavad Gita where Bhakti Yogena is used? Um. Hare Krishna Prabhu, I don't remember the beginning, but I can remember the from the middle. Uh, it says, Bhakti Yogena Sevate Sagunan Samati Pvetan Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. Yes, thank you very, very, very good. Uh, it's Mamcha Yogi Vicharena Bhakti Yogena Sevate Sagunan Samityatan Brahma Bhutayata Kalpate. So this is it appears in the 14th chapter where uh, uh, Krishna says that, uh, that through the process of Bhakti Yogena, one uh, that you know, one is able to come to the level of Brahman or 
or, or Krishna. Um, Bhakti Yogena also appears in Srimad Bhagavatam quite a bit. One of the famous verses in Srimad Bhagavatam is, is Akama Savra Kamova, Moksha Kamudharadi, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, Yajate Purusham Param, that Akam Sarva Kame, that whether a person is full of desires or without desires, Moksha Kamudharadi, or whether he is wanting liberation, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, that through the process of Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti, bhakti Yoga, all this can be very quickly uh, uh, achieved. So in this particular word, verse, what did Vyasadev achieve through the process of Bhakti Yogena? Manasi Samayak Pranite Amale. That through the process of Bhakti Yoga, he was able to, he was able to focus his Amale Manasi. So Amale means, Mal means uh, contamination, Amal means uncontaminated. So he was able to focus his uncontaminated mind in samyak pranahite, that, that in perfect absorption. So this is the definition of, so if you remember the chapter 6 of the Bhagavad Gita, this is the definition of samadhi. But the difference is that Srila Vyasadev is not following the process of astanga yoga. Through the process of bhakti yogena, he is able to, to reach the stage of samyak pranahite. So the understanding is that through bhakti yoga, everything can be achieved. Vyasadeva, in this case, he wants to reach the stage of samadhi. He, he uses bhakti yoga. Anybody wants to achieve anything, whether they want to reach, the, reach what uh, uh, the process of karma uh, gives them, what the process of jnana gives them, what the process of astang gives them, all these processes are subsumed within the stage of bhakti yoga. So this is what he did. Now the last two lines is, what did he see? Apashyat. So it says apashyat. So he saw three things. He saw purusham purnam. So purusham purnam means that he saw the the, the complete person. So Jiva Goswami says that according to the, the Mukha Pragar, Pragahar Vritti, which is a logic that says that one attending to the highest meaning, that if a phrase has many meanings, then Mukta Pragar Vritti means tending to the highest meaning. He says that this Purusham Purnam means Krishna. And in order to substantiate it, he quotes the he quotes the Padma Puran, wherein it's it is said that uh, the Bhagwan the words Bhagwan and Purush, when indicating something devoid of all upadis, mean Vasudev, the soul of all beings. So, so, Vas, so the word Bhagwan and 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 Purusha. Uh, when one tends to their to, to their most exalted meaning, points to Krishna. So Srila Vyasadev, he saw Purusham Purnam, or in other words, he saw uh, he, he saw Krishna. So uh, so Jiva Goswami is quoting this particular logic because uh, uh, both Bhagwan and Purush they can be used to refer to others, other things also. So uh, Bhagwan is often used to address a person who is in a relatively higher position than you are. So in, in the Vedas, it is used as a term of, as a, as a term of veneration and, and respect. And we've already seen just now how Sutta Goswami is addressing Vyasadeva as Bhagwan or Narad Muni as Bhagwan. And even in conversation, to some extent, Nagmuni and Vyasadev are Bhagwan, they are Shakti uh, But even in the social etiquette, people are addressed as Bhagwan if they are in a, in a superior position. Similarly, Purush. Purush is referred to men, or it is referred to somebody who is powerful, or could be referring to the to, to the to the uh, Purushavtars. So, but since the word Purush is qualified with param, 
which is uh, supreme, Jiva Goswami is saying that we should follow the, the Mukha Pragar Priti, which means, so Param means that look at the highest possible meaning of this word. And that is why he's quoting this verse from the Bhagavad, from the Padma Puran to say that the highest possible meaning of Purush is, Swayam, is, is uh, uh, Vasudev. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, just a little aside that uh, we often say Vasudev is son, son of Vasudev. Uh, in Garg Samhita, it is also indicated that, uh, so, the Vas so Vasu means a place of residence like nivas so the root word is vas place of residence so the body has eight vasus which is the five senses and then the mind intelligence and heart and all these are are ruled by krishna so that is why he is known as vasudev dev means one who is the predominating deity so because he is the predominating deity of this of the eight vasus in the body he is known as uh, is known as uh, uh, Vasudev. Um, in a similar, uh, so one thing I noticed was that uh, all the Acharyas, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, uh, Jiva Goswami, Srila Prabhupada, they spent some time uh, making sure that we understand that this phrase, Purusham Param, refers to Krishna and Krishna only. Because it is in the context of this verse that the Bhagavatam uh, that the Bhagavatam is defined. So just like when we are doing Samanda Gyan, very important to establish the identities of the of the people in play. So that is why we see that Prabhupada, so Jiva Goswami in uh, Kram Sandharva, he spends quite some time saying, you know, applies this. Uh, Nyai to say that Purusham Param can only refer to Krishna. Um, Vishnu Chakrabarti Thakur, he says that uh, um, uh, the word Purusham is, indicates the Chit Shakti. So the Chit Shakti is the knowing potency. So he says that it indicates the Chit Shakti that is arising from the Swarup and all the Amshas of, of uh, Krishna. Uh, so he again gives another analogy that if someone says that I have seen the full moon, that means he has automatically seen the half moon, the quarter moon, the, all the all the the phases of the of, of the moon. So uh, when Sri Vyasadeva is saying Purusham Param, that means he is seeing uh, Krishna in his Swarup along with all the Amshas. And in addition to that, he is also seeing Srimati Radharani and uh, all the Leelas of Krishna as well as the entire spiritual world. So Vishwana Chakravati Thakur further expands. It's saying that Purusham Param not only means Krishna Swayam Bhagwan, it means Radharani, it means all the Amshas, the, the avatars of Krishna, it means Krishna Leela, and it also means the spiritual world. So this is all that, all that was seen by Srila Vyasadeva in his, in, his, uh, in his trance. So what we can infer is that Srila Vyasadeva saw Krishna and his internal energy. So Vyasadeva saw Krishna and his qualities. And Vyasadeva saw Krishna and his dealings with his devotees. So Prabhupada in the purport he says, the absolute vision is the personality of Godhead as confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 7.19. So this is that verse Vasudeva Sarvamiti. So in the Upanishads, also it is confirmed that Vasudeva, the personality of Godhead, is covered by the, by the golden growing Hiranmayana Patrena. So this is the Prabhupada. He doesn't mention it, but uh, this is the Mantra 15 in his Upanishad. So the Hiranmayana Patrena veil of impersonal Brahman. And when the curtain is removed by the mercy of the Lord, the real face of the Absolute is seen. 
the absolute is mentioned here as purush or person the absolute personality of godhead is mentioned in so many vedic literatures and in bhagavad gita the purush is confirmed as the eternal and original person so where in bhagavad gita is this does this happen where uh, the purusha is confirmed as the eternal and the original person so we know it happens in the 10th chapter where uh, arjun starts to glorify krishna that uh, um, you are the supreme person you are the origin of all you are the lord of all god of gods he goes on glorifying so that's one place then we know in the 11th chapter after krishna reveals the universal form then once again arjun goes on this uh, on this glorification you are the original personality of godhead you are the oldest ultimate sanctuary and um, at other places krishna he himself reveals himself as the as the original person so so we know that one thing that shila vasudev saw the first thing that vasudev saw was purusham param which is krishna and his internal energy then mayamcha second thing that he saw was mayamcha <clears throat> so cha means cha means uh, and or also so the word cha is important because it it creates a difference between krishna and maya so uh, uh, vyasadev is not saying that that uh, or sutta goswami is not saying that vyasadev saw uh, uh, krishna radha cha Be- so because along with krishna is shrimati radha rani along with krishna is his, is his eternal devotees uh, uh, eternal devotees but he is saying mayam cha so mayam cha means it so the point that is made is that not as a part of purusham but separate that maya devi is separate from brahman separate from parmatma and purusha so just as one may look at the sky and say that i see the moon and the stars so when somebody makes that point so the clear inference is that the stars are distinct and separate from the moon so similarly when uh, sutta so says mayam cha it means that maya devi is distinct and separate from krishna so in the purport propa says the supreme person has many fold energies out of which the internal external and marginal energies are specifically important the energy mentioned here is the external energy as will be clear from the active statements of her activities the internal energy is there along with the absolute person as the moonlight is there with the moon the external energy is compared to darkness because it keeps the living entities in the darkness of ignorance what is the third thing that vyasadev saw he saw tadapar shrayam so tadapar shrayam means under full control so he saw krishna he saw maya devi and then he saw the relationship between them so the relationship is that maya devi is fully under the control of krishna and propa says the word apashram suggests that this energy of the lord is under his full control so the natural conclusion from this is that because maya devi is under the control of krishna krishna can never be under the control of maya devi so this verse is a critical verse that is used in in uh, in uh, disambiguating the claims of the mayavadis who basically say that under some situations maya takes control of the brahman it overpowers the brahman and then the jiva appears so from this verse we can understand that uh, because maya devi is the dapashrayam that maya devi is fully taking shelter is fully under the control of krishna krishna can never be under the control of 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 a maya devi and uh, this word and this this concept is made in bhagavad gita also so many times so there is a famous verse in bhagavad gita that makes this point does anybody remember that verse maya dakshina prakriti surite sachara charam thank you very much so this appears in the in the ninth chapter that uh, uh, this material nature is working under my 
under my uh, uh, control. Uh, seventh chapter also Krishna says that all states of goodness, passion, and ignorance are manifested by, by, by me, but I am independent. So he makes makes this point. Same point is made in Brahma Samhita also. So there's a verse in Brahma Samhita um, about the relationship between Krishna and Maya Devi. Yeah. Does yeah. anybody remember the verse? This is the verse Shristi Sirji Pralaya Sadhana Shakti Eka Chaye Bajasa Dhanan Bhubarti Durga Ichyana Rupa Piyasya Picheshta Tesha Vrindamadi Purusham. That Shristi Sirji Pralaya Sadhana Shakti Eka Chaye Bajasa Bhubanan Bhubarti Durga. That according to the instructions, according to the wishes of Krishna, Durga Devi conducts her, conducts herself. And Srila Prabhupada also quotes other verses. He quotes a verse from the Svetashwar uh, Upanishad. And same point is made in Bhagavatam also. So we see now the realization of, of uh, Vyasadev so far. Um, he has seen the Lord, Purusham Param. He has seen his internal energies that are int intimately related to the Lord. Um, and he has seen external energy that is separate from Krishna and completely under his. What? Yeah, I think somebody had a question. Okay, so I'll go to the next verse. Any questions on this? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Mataji. So, so when, uh, when it is said Mayam Cha, that means uh, he saw Krishna and Maya separately, right? Uh, together. Yes. Yes. Well, he saw them in his vision, in the same vision, but he saw them uh, as distinct and separate. Yeah. Right. Because it is said where, where there is Krishna, there is no Maya. And wherever there is Maya, there is no Krishna. Yes. Uh, yes. I was trying to validate that. Same point. The same point is made here. Thank you, Sure. Any other question? Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Sharan Prabhu. Hare Krishna. And you say this is a turning point in the Srimad Bhagavatam where Vyasadev now will go deeper into the meditation of Krishna. And um, that means it could have been something, some oh, other deities, but not Krishna. This is confirmed that Krishna is a true personality of Godhead. Yeah, I, I missed the last sentence, Prabhu. Could you repeat it? So I say that, uh, you know, uh, for, for especially people from Indian origin, mm -hmm. uh, we say we have many gods. Mm -hmm. And uh, now you say that this is a turning point in the Srimad Bhagavatam, mm -hmm. this verse, mm -hmm. where um, Vyasadeva Vya will meditate upon Krishna as a supreme person of Godhead. Mm -hmm. And for for other um, you know um, deities in the Hindu gods in general, mm -hmm. not any others but Krishna. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. This is what yeah. confirmed that. Exactly. Exactly. It it points to the ekatva of Krishna. That when Srila Vyasa they meditated on the personality of Godhead, then lo and behold, who appears? Krishna and only Krishna along with his devotees. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good point. Okay. 175. Ya samota jiva atmanam trigunatmakam varu apiman nityanartham tat kratam cha vipatyate. Due to this material, due to this external energy, the living entity, all the transcendental to the three modes of material nature, thinks of himself as a material product and thus undergoes the reactions of the material miseries. So in the next four verses, we see, we see the compassion of Srila Vyasadev towards the, the conditioned living entities and the compilation of the, of the Bhagavata. So the verse is the continuing, con continuation of the vision of Srila Vyasadev 
So previously he saw Krishna, he saw Maya Devi, and he saw the relationship between the between the two, which was Maya Devi being under the under the full control of Krishna and thus unable to to uh, uh, to bewilder. So one may say that just seeing the sweetness and the supremacy of Krishna, that should have been enough for Srila Vyasadeva to compose the Bhagavatam. Uh, because essentially the Bhagavatam is a glorification of Krishna. So he saw Krishna supremely powerful and, and indescribably sweet. So that should have been enough of an impetus for him to, to compose the Bhagavatam. What was the purpose of him seeing Maya Devi? And Vishwanath Chakravati Thagu comments and uh, he, he, he says that the, the real impetus for Srila Vyasadeva to compose the Bhagavatam was not to glorify Krishna, but to rescue the jivas who were conditioned or who were trapped by Maya. So uh, 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 Vyasadeva was chastised by Narad Muni for misleading the jivas. And uh, in this vision, he basically he sees the he sees the root cause of the bewilderment of the of the of the jiva. <clears throat> so Vishwanath Chakravarti makes the point that uh, a doctor will not prescribe a medicine unless he determines what is the root cause of the disease. So. Vyasadeva is seeing that the general mass of the people are suffering. But in this vision, he now saw the reason of their suffering. The reason that they are suffering is that they have been covered by the bewildering potency of Maya. And even though the jiva is separate from Maya, but because he thinks himself, as uh, something made of matter, he accepts a bodily identification. So this verse is not to uh, not to diminish the importance of Srila Vyasadeva seeing Krishna. That was glorious, and uh, that would have caused him to compose something that was that is meant for the Paramhansas which describes the glories of Krishna that only one who is completely purified could have understood. But because in the same vision, he saw the jivas, he saw us, he saw us suffering. He saw the cause of our suffering and thus he also saw the remediation for that suffering. And that's what makes the Bhagavatam so special. So uh, the previous verse was Vyasadeva seeing the relationship between Krishna and Maya Devi. This verse he's seeing the relationship between the Jiva and Maya Devi. So the internal energy of Krishna, Yoga Maya, serves to connect one to Krishna, the external energy of Krishna, which is Mahamaya, serves to disconnect one from Krishna. So that is why the jiva that accepts the covering of Maya also accepts the fact that he or she wants to be disconnected from Krishna. So both the Mayas, they, they have the same effect. So Maya literally means that which is not. Uh, but the difference is where they lead the jiva. So the yoga maya also makes one forget Krishna's divinity. But it results in intensifying one's relationship to Krishna. So the mood may get in, intensified into apparently, apparently unfavorable ways. Like in Vrindavan, we see Jatila, Kutila. So they are unfavorably inclined under the influence of Maya Devi. Or we see some of 
his Gopa friends who have this mode of chivalry towards Krishna. Or like Sridama, he tries to protect Krishna. Now, if Sridama was aware of Krishna, all the time aware that Krishna is the personality of Godhead, then he would never he would never say, Krishna, you take shelter of my arms and I will protect you. But all, so that is yoga maya. All, it is making one forget one's position with respect to Krishna in order to increase one's uh, affinity to Krishna. But Durga Devi's business is Yaya Samohi Jiva. In this verse, Sutta says Yaya Samohi Jiva, which is that Samohita. So Mohita means to bewilder, Samohita means to completely bewilder. And uh, Paraapi. So Paraapi means that even though he is para, even though he is transcendental. So even though the jiva is transcendental, even then the, the effect of Maya Devi is Yaya Samohita Jiva. And why? Because, because Manyate Atmanam Trigunatmaki. So this word Manyate is important that uh, Maya Devi does not forcibly cover the Jiva. The Maya, Maya Devi is invited by the Jiva to cover himself. So that is why he says Manyate Atmanam Trigunatmaki. That when the Jiva begins to consider himself Atmanam as, as a product of the three modes of material nature, Paraapi, even though he is transcendental to, to matter, Yaya Samohita Ajiva. Maya Devi is able to completely bewilder, bewilder him. And because of that, Tatkritam, because of that, what happens? Chabi Padyate Anartham. And because of that, Chabi Padyate means the Jiva undergoes Anartham, many unwanted reactions. So uh, this short phrase, it gives a complete synopsis of the existence of the, of the conditioned soul. That the soul is bewildered, it is associating itself with matter, it considers itself a product of matter, covered by maya, and the reason is because manyate, because that is what he considers himself to be. Um, Burijan Prabhu makes this point that uh, it is interesting to note the difference between the relationship between Krishna and Maya in the previous verse and the Jiva and Maya in this verse. So in the previous verse, Maya Devi appeared under the full control of Krishna. In this verse, Maya Devi appears as being fully in control of the Jivas. So Maya Devi, while insignificant and compared to Krishna, becomes very powerful and controlling when, when, uh, uh, when in connection with the, with the, with the Jiva. And in this context, uh, so this is not really Vedic, at least not that I know of. I think it is more of a humorous trivia, but uh, I read it somewhere, so I'll share it. That it is said that when a, when a child is born, then the soul realizes that uh, I have another, that says, what have I done? I have taken another birth. So he says, no, no, not another birth. So what is the Sanskrit for no? So no. Says, Ma. So the, so the child says, Ma, Ma. And then the mother thinks that the child is calling out to her. So in almost all languages, the, the word for mother is, is, is Ma. And then the child, after some time, he says that, I know why I have, this, why I have taken this birth because of the root sin I have committed of being disconnected to, to Krishna. So he says, so Sanskrit for sin is Pap. So he says, Ma Papa. So then the father thinks that he is being called. So Ma and Papa is the soul saying, no more sins. I'm not going to do any more sins. But it gets uh, the mother and father, they take on that 
Upadis. So again, this is not Vedic. I'm not even sure it is authentic, but I found it very humorous when I read it. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so Vyasadev, he, he, he sees this interaction between Maya and Jeev, and, and, and Jiva, that uh, the Jiva is voluntarily accepting the, the supremacy and the divinity of, 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 uh, uh, of Maya. And again, this point is made by, so there's a, there's a famous verse in, in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna makes this point, uh, appears in the 15th chapter. So there are many verses, but 15th chapter, there's a famous verse, Mame Vangsha Jeeva Loke Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana Mana Shashtayantayani Prakriti Stani Karsati. Krishna says that all these jivas are my parts, but, but Prakriti Stani Karsati. That um, um, due to conditioned life, they're struggling very hard. And the Acharya's list many, many verses where um, 1322, 329, 327, 35, 333, uh, all from Bhagavad Gita, which talk about the relationship between um, um, the Jiva and Maya. So as per Jiva Goswami, this verse establishes Abhide and Prayojan. So the essential difference between Jiva and the Lord is that the Jiva is fallible and the Lord is infallible. So this describes Abhide, which is how can the fallible approach infallible through the process of bhakti. Bhakti can only be established when two things happen. There is a permanent, permanent differentiation between the Lord and the Jiva, and there is an acknowledgement of the eternal supremacy of the Lord. So these two verses make that, make this, this point. They refer to Krishna as, uh, as Paramam Purush. They refer to Jiva separately and they refer to the supremacy of the Lord and the fallibility of the Jiva. So according to Jiva Goswami, it establishes that the Abhide or the process is that of or linking these two is, is uh, that of bhakti. And by acting on this process, the prayojan, which is prema, can be, can be, can be uh, attained. And Jiva Goswami in Krama Sandarbha, he also makes this point that even though the Jiva is superior to Maya, he gets bewildered by Maya, which indicates that the Jiva is conscious. So remember the Kram Sandarbha is a commentary on the Tattva Sandarbha, where he is talking about the nature of the soul. So he says that an object that is insensient simply acts according to its nature. So water will act according to it being water, regardless of any circumstances. Only when something has consciousness does it have the ability to change its intrinsic nature. And that consciousness is a symptom of free will. So the fact that the jiva is intrinsically a servant of Krishna, but is able to change its, uh, uh, its uh, relationship and become a servant of Maya, indicates that not only is the jiva conscious, but it is individually conscious. So he makes both these points. That the jiva is eternal and he is uh, atomic because there is the, uh, if, if it was a collective consciousness, then the whole consciousness would have been contaminated in this way. But the fact that there are some jivas who are liberated and some who are not indicates that different jivas are exercising their consciousness in different, uh, different ways. So even though the jiva is Swarup Bhuta Jnana, they said even though the jiva is full of knowledge, but the fact that the jiva is conscious means that they have free will, which means that they can do anything that they want. So whether 
so, so an example is that uh, we may know that uh, um, maybe eating um, uh, eating certain kind of food is not healthy for us, but we can still choose to eat it because we have the free will, because we have the we have the consciousness in order to make that decision. Um, Yeah, I think the only only other point that is made is that uh, what is Krishna doing while Maya Devi is beating Jiva around? So we see the Jiva helplessly under the control of Maya. What is Krishna doing? So um, um, Acharya say Krishna is doing nothing. So he says in the Bhagavad Gita, na date kashchit pavam na chayva. It does not take anybody's pious and sinful activities. He is, he is neutral. So Krishna is doing nothing because the Jiva is doing, has wants to do nothing with Krishna. So Krishna is just reciprocating. So it's not that Krishna is encouraging Maya Devi to, to uh, overpower. It is not that once the, uh, uh, the jiva is overpowered by Maya, is Krishna coming to the rescue of jiva? He is just sitting there neutral. The reason being that the jiva himself has invited Maya Devi to overpower him. But on the other hand, when the jiva turns to Krishna, then Krishna takes an active, uh, takes an active role in rescuing the jiva from Maya Devi. And there's a verse in Bhagavad Gita in the ninth chapter that talks about it. So Samoam Sarabhuteshu Name Dveshanti Napriya Ye Bhajante Te Maam Bhakti Amayate Teshu Chapriya. And Krishna says, I'm neutral to everybody, but one who is my devotee, he lives in me and I'm a friend to him. So when one, when, when a jiva becomes a devotee of Krishna, then Krishna takes an active interest and then actively tries to rescue the jiva from the clutches of Maya. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I ran over time, but I'll stop here and see if we have any uh, any questions or comments. Um, Proji, one question on the process of meditation. Um, so this, uh, like this, like Vyasadeva is seeing all this, uh, uh, like is he thinking about it or is, is the meditation just like happening? On its own card. So, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't get your question. So the meditation of Vyasadev is that um, is that is it happening on its own? Like, is is the Lord putting these in his mind, or like, I mean, or is he like making an no. effort to meditate? No, no, uh, it's not that. So, so it's not that Krishna is putting anything in Vyasa's mind. Vyasadeva is seeing things as they are. Right? So, so the meditation of Vyasadeva is, um, it's not metaphorical. I think if that's your question, it's not that he's seeing that, uh, that Krishna, he constructs something that, that is a metaphor into what is happening and shows that to Vyasadeva and, and, you know, and then Vyasadeva, interprets that um, through the process of Bhakti Yoga. Now. So through the process of Bhakti Yoga, Srila Vyasadeva is able to see things as they are. So he's able to see Krishna, he's able to see Krishna's energies, Maya Devi, uh, Jiva. He's able to see all that uh, as, as, they are, as they are existing. So it is a factual, uh, it is a factual display of uh, uh, the situation that Vyasadev sees. I think that was your question, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, so like you did mention about um, like one point in the previous was about uh, Ashtang Yoga. So mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that, that this is um, uh, like he did not perform Ashtang Yoga, he did Bhakti, bhakti Yoga, and he did Bhakti Yoga. Um, um, so, so yeah, I was just wondering whether this process of meditation, whether it is um like you know is it like uh, um i mean meditation as we know it is like fixing the mind on the lord or fixing yes. Uh, yes. 
being yes, in the yes, yes. So, so what you're saying is absolutely right. So samadhi is basically, you know, samadhi that uh, samyak that you become the same. So essentially, you are you become fully connected with the chit shakti of the Lord. You know, which is why in samadhi you're able to see what Krishna is seeing. And different stages of it, but at the highest stage of absorption where Vyasadeva is, he's able to see, he gets Krishna's vision. He's able to see what Krishna is seeing. And that's why he gets this, this transcendental vision. Uh, typically speaking, the stage of Samadhi is the eighth stage of the Astang Yoga. But we don't see Vyasadeva going through any of the stages of uh, Astang Yoga. Instead, what he does is, it says Bhakti Yogena, and then right after that, he enters into the stage of Samadhi. So the stage that he is in is the stage of Samadhi, which is a perfection of Astang Yoga, but he attains that through Bhakti Yoga. Okay, well, yeah, thank you. You don't look, con you don't look convinced, uh, you don't sound convinced rather. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I'm just like thinking like, you know, this, this, like I was actually just reading about Ashtang Yoga and uh, like, you know, this process of um, going through Yam Niyam and like, you know, how we can, um, how it can help even Bhakti Yogis to, um, to like advance basically, like, you know, take, take the good things from the Ashtang Yoga system and then, um, you know, um, like purify our, our senses, our mind intelligence and 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 then reach the stage of samadhi and uh so i was just trying to like understand what does this uh, samadhi like you know what does exactly this samadhi and can like, entails or like what does it consist of uh right. whether it is the lord giving the 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 the, vis the the thinking capacity or whether it is something that the yogi met like you know thinks about or um like what happens basically in this in this so so one so one uh, understanding of the stage of samadhi is uh, through the process of astang yoga actually is that of dhruva maharaj uh, dhruva maharaj went through the more conventional process of astang yoga and then when he reached the stage of samadhi you know then again he became one with the lord in meditation so it is explained that, so we know that when Dhruva Maharaj was at that stage, um, the, uh, the whole universe started to choke up. And the reason was that while he was meditating on Krishna, Krishna was meditating on him. And because Dhruva Maharaj had stopped breathing, then Krishna also stopped breathing. And that's why the whole universe, it, it started choking up and then everybody went and then Krishna came and, and gave benediction to, to, to Dhruva. So uh, technically what it is said is that at the stage of Samadhi, one gets connected to the Chit Shakti, to, to the knowing potency of, of Krishna. So in the more uh, early stages, uh, you know, uh, the yogi, through these stages of Samadhi, he is able to become, he is able to see, just like Krishna sees, he becomes Trikalagya. He's able to see past, present, and future. He develops divine vision, which means he's able to see things very far away. He can see things inside other things. Uh, those are all considered to be the early stages of, uh, of this Astang Yoga, the very early stages of, of Samadhi. What Vyas is representing over here is a very advanced stage of Samadhi, where he's actually able to see the entire existence as Krishna sees it. And Krishna is seeing himself, Krishna is seeing Yoga Maya, Krishna is seeing uh, the Jivas, Krishna is seeing Mahamaya. And in the trance, Srila Vyasadeva is able to see all of that. So that is the, so that is the Samadhi, which is connecting with, with uh, it's connecting that intimately with Krishna. Okay, okay. Understood, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mataji, you had a question? Yeah. yeah, actually, uh, you said that Jiva is superior to Maya, right? Uh, in while explaining, uh, I, I wanted to know more. Am I, when you when it says Maya, does it refer to inert matter or Maya Devi material nature? 
It refers to uh, it refers to Maya Devi in the sense that uh, the uh, the jiva is superior to the influence of Maya. So uh, Maya Devi is an energy of Krishna. So that way Maya Devi is divine. So Krishna says this uh, Devi. Uh, he, he calls he calls her Devi, divine. Uh, but uh, a uh, Maya Devi in herself does not have any ability to control the jiva. So that way the jiva is considered to be superior to Maya. But uh, so because of the spiritual nature, it is superior. Because of uh, so they're both spiritual, right? Maya Devi is also spiritual. Yeah, that's what I was not understanding how Jiva is spiritual to Maya in terms of Maya. Superior to Maya. Because uh, 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 because the because of of uh, uh, so in the current condition stage, the jiva is inferior to Maya because the jiva is fully controlled by Maya. In the liberated stage, the jiva is superior to Maya because the jiva is completely beyond the control of Maya. So those are the two the two stages of the jiva that is that is considered now intrinsically the jiva is beyond the control of maya and which is why the jiva is considered to be considered to be uh, uh, to be superior but despite that the fact that he opts to take an inferior position and allows himself to be mm -hmm. puts maya devi in a in a superior position okay yeah. Yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. It's a good question. It's very nice, thoughtful questions. Okay, we're a little bit over, but if there's any other concluding thoughts, remarks? Nice class, Prabhu. Thank you. So we'll end over here. Vanchakalpata Rubayascha Kripasenu Vikavacha Sitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavivyo Namonamra Namantakoti Vaishnavrinda Ki Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Itai Gaur Pivanam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna